free enterprise is threatened today, not because of its failure, but because of its success. That is, free enterprise has been so successful, excuse me, <clears throat> has been so successful in eliminating the traditional problems of mankind, such as disease, pestilence, hunger, and gross poverty, that all other human problems appear to us to be at once inexcusable and unbearable. The desire by many Americans to eliminate, <coughs> to eliminate these so-called unbearable and inexcusable problems, inexcusable problems has led us away from the basic ideals and principles upon which our nation was built. In the name of other ideas, ideals such as equality of income, sex and race balance, affordable housing, medical care, orderly markets, consumer protection, energy conservation, just to name a few, we have abandoned many personal freedoms. As a result of widespread control by our government in order to achieve these so-called higher objectives, we are increasingly being subordinated to the point where considerations of personal liberty are but secondary and tertiary matters. In other words, they're increasingly uh, considered to be dirt. Now you might say, well, what's this guy talking about? Our liberties being trampled upon. Well, let me give you an example. Suppose I write the United States Congress and I say, my name is Walter Williams and I am an emancipated adult. I am fully capable of taking care of my own retirement needs. If I fail to do so, let me die on the streets or go out begging, but stop taking money out of my paycheck for your government retirement program, namely Social Security. How do you think that'd be greeted? <laughs> It'd be greeted with contempt. Now here are people telling you and me how much we should set, set aside out of each week's pay, paycheck for retirement. What if they told us how much to set aside out of each week's pay for food, for housing, for vacations, for our, for, for our children's education? We would view it as tyranny. What right do they have? Well, the ultimate end to this process is totalitarianism, which is no more than a reduced form of servitude. Remember, if you take steps towards any goal, it's just a matter of when you're gonna get there. I'm not saying that we are a totalitarian nation yet. But if you ask the question, which way are we headed, tiny steps at a time, are we headed towards more personal liberty or towards more government control over our lives? It would have to unambiguously be the latter. Or as David Hume, the great philosopher David Hume said, it's seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. Or maybe a more insightful way of describing this process is to consider what Leonard Reed said. Leonard Reed was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, the first free market institute in the United States in, uh, in 1946. And Leonard Reed said, if you wanted to take liberty away from Americans, you had to know how to cook a frog. Leonard Reed said, you can't cook a frog by putting on a pot of boiling water and then throwing the frog in the water. Because the frog's reflexes are so quick, as soon as his feet touch the boiling water, he would hop away and be free. He said that the way to cook a frog is to put on a pot of cold water, put the frog in the water, and heat it up bit by bit. And by the time the frog realized he was being cooked, it was too late. <laughs> That's the same thing with Americans. If anybody came over here talking about taking away all of our liberties all at once, 
we would righteously rebel. But they can talk about taking away our liberties bit by bit. The primary justification for the attack on personal liberty, private property, economic freedom, can be found in people's desire for government to do good. We all say things like, government should care for the poor. Government should help the disadvantaged. Government should help the elderly, failing businesses. Government should help college students and other deserving segments of our society. Well, this might be nice to say that, but we have to recognize that government has no resources of its very own. Now, what I mean by that, ladies and gentlemen, those programs coming out of Washington or out of your state capitol, they don't represent congressmen and legislators reaching in their own pockets and sending out the money. Moreover, there's no tooth fairy giving them the money. <laughs> there's no Santa Claus giving them the money. Now, once you recognize that government has no resources of its very own, that forces you to recognize that the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that dollar from some other American. Now, if you believe I'm being too loose with the terminology, intimidation, threats, and coercion, and confiscation, you have until April 15th next year to check me out. <laughs> now, we Americans, we ask government to do things that if a private person did the identical thing, we would roundly condemn him as ordinary despicable thief. <clears throat> For example, I might see an elderly lady sleeping out on a grate in the dead of winter. She's hungry, she needs some medical attention, and she needs some shelter. Now I could walk up to Dr. Benjamin Powell with a gun in my hand and say, Ben, give me your $200. Then having gotten this $200, I can go down and help the lady out, buy her some medical attention, some food, and shelter. Would you find me guilty of a crime? I'd be guilty of a crime regardless of what I did with the money. I'd be guilty of theft, because what is theft? Theft is taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. Now, most Americans can agree with me on that. They'll say, yeah, Williams, that's theft. Now, is there any conceptual distinction between that act, where I walked up the bend, and when the agents of the United States Congress tell me, Walter Williams, you know that $200 you made last week, that you planned to buy a nice bottle of Chateau de Chem Sauterne wine? <laughs> you will not do that with the money. You'll give it to us, and we will go downtown and help the lady out. I assert that there's no conceptual distinction between the two acts. If you press me for a distinction, the first act is illegal theft, and the second act is legal theft. It's just a matter of legality. And moral people cannot be guided by legality alone. Because there are many things in this world that are or were legal, but clearly immoral. That is, slavery was legal. Does that make it moral? The Nazi persecution of Jews was legal. Did that make it moral? So we, as moral people, we must ask the question, is it moral to take what belongs to one person and give it to another to whom it does not belong? Now, don't misunderstand me, ladies and gentlemen. I believe in helping our fellow man in need. I think it is praiseworthy and laudable when a person seeks to help his fellow man by reaching into his own pockets. 
I think that reaching into someone else's pockets to help your fellow man in need is worthy of condemnation. And for the Christians among us, when God gave Moses the commandment, thou shalt not steal, I'm quite sure he did not mean thou shalt not steal unless you got a majority vote in Congress. Yeah. 